The Economist. Hello and welcome to The Intelligence from The Economist. I'm Jason Palmer. And I'm Aura Ogunbi. Most weekdays, as you surely know by now, we provide a fresh perspective on the events shaping your world. Today, though, a little something different to draw attention to what we call our explainers. They started as an online-only feature on our website called The Economist Explains. Short, sharp answers to questions that the news agenda poses. What's the difference between a ceasefire and a humanitarian pause? Or who are the Houthi rebels? What is friendshoring or El Nino? Yeah, this year I really liked the one about why Winnie the Pooh makes Xi Jinping so uncomfortable. A personal favorite for me was what makes ultra-processed foods so bad for your health. It was both fun and kind of frightening. These explainers have been wildly popular on the website, and they're a natural fit to our mission here on The Intelligence, telling you not just what happened, but why and what it means. So we don't flag these up as explainers, we sneak them into your daily diet. Yeah, you're welcome. And today we're going to go through four of our most popular ones from 2023. From why France freaked out about bedbugs this year. To whether Beyonce can cause inflation. And what is the history of the police mugshot? Right, let's get into it. Or I guess I should say, first up though. We've been telling you for years about the fentanyl crisis in America, an opioid drug that continues to ravage the country. This year, that story seemed to take an even more ominous turn as we learned about Trank Dope, a mix that includes fentanyl. That combination is killing people. Deaths so associated so. with Trank Dope are skyrocketing. They've almost quadrupled since 2019 and are rising as a share of the shocking number of fentanyl-related deaths. The Biden administration's drug czar is now calling it an emerging threat. In July this year, the White House announced a plan to tackle Trank Dope head-on before it gets any worse than it already is. Trank Dope combines fentanyl, a synthetic opioid drug that is ravaging America, with a strong non-opioid tranquilizer called xylosine or Trank, which vets usually use to sedate horses, deer, and other large animals. Emily Steinmark writes for our U.S. digital team. And it was first detected in the early 2000s in Puerto Rico, but in years since, it's circulated in sort of limited areas in the American Northeast, kind of taking the same route as fentanyl when it first got into the country. Now, though, Trank Dope, the combination of the two, is detected in almost every single state in America. And according to the Drug Enforcement Administration, it's probably mixed by local dealers and then reaches the streets that way. Well, why make the mix in the first place? It's cost, basically. Silocene can be bought for as little as $6 per kilo on Chinese websites. And fentanyl is much more expensive and supplied by Mexican drug cartels. Drug suppliers can maximize on profits by basically cutting fentanyl, the expensive stuff, with the less expensive silocene and just bulk it up that way. And so many users, when they're buying it on the street, don't actually know whether they're buying pure fentanyl or whether they're buying trank dope. So the DEA in March said that now a quarter of American fentanyl is laced with trank and so is basically trank dope. In 2021, that proportion was more than 90% on the streets of Philadelphia. And is it a greater concern than fentanyl itself, which is already a grave concern for America? It's a different type of concern. So the thing with Trank Dope that makes it particularly nasty is that it causes these deep necrotic wounds, like so the skin and the muscle just rot away. It might remind you, and it reminds many people, of crocodile, a drug that was sort of big in Eastern Europe 10, 15 years ago. And these wounds can become infected. You might need to actually amputate limbs. So you'll see people on the street that have these really big flesh wounds. It's quite different to fentanyl. And the thing is also about Trank Dope is that it's known as a zombie drug because large doses of it cause loss of consciousness. So you turn into a zombie, basically. It just means users become really easy targets for assault, robbery, if they're just lying on the street and not fully there, and they're unable to really put up a fight in any way or look after themselves. And in those cases where somebody takes a lot of it or too much of it, is there an antidote? 
Not really. So there is emergency treatment for fentanyl overdose, which is called naloxone, but that's ineffective against the non-opioid part of it, ineffective against TRANK. The way it works is that for opioids like fentanyl, it sort of acts on opioid receptors in the brain to reverse the dangerous effects of the drug, so suppressed breathing, the sort of stuff that will eventually kill you. But there is no such antidote for psilocine or TRANK. It's something that researchers are working on, but right now we don't really have a good option. Nothing that's approved for humans anyway. So what would happen if you found somebody who was overdosed on tranked dope is that you would still give them the emergency treatment for fentanyl, but the person might need something more to actually survive the overdose. So they would need to go to hospital, they would probably need extra oxygen or breathing support, just because they are really heavily sedated on top of also being exposed to a very strong opioid. And in a similar way, this doesn't seem like so much a different drug, but one simply added to the fentanyl problem that's already out there. I think that's true. And I think that's also the way that the Biden administration is seeing this. They have a national plan to reduce deaths from trank dope by 15% in large parts of the country by 2025. But if you actually ask addiction medics, they will say that fentanyl, synthetic opioids in general, remains the chief concern. It kills more Americans every year. 70,000 died from it in 2021 compared to the 43,000 people that died from car crashes, just to put that into perspective. However, those taking trank dope, they are at greater risk of fatal overdose. And so I think in some you can take away that Trank dope, yes, it adds to the problem, but it also complicates an already very difficult battle against overdose deaths in America, and it risks making people that are already very vulnerable potentially taking drugs on the street even more so. Emily, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. In recent weeks, you might have seen these news stories about insects crawling across the globe. Fears about bedbugs started in France, and within days, a rise in cases became a national hysteria. France is sounding the alarm as a widespread bedbug outbreak sweeps through Paris. The pests have been spotted at places like movie theaters. Social media was full of these videos of tiny insects, not much bigger than an apple pip, crawling across train seats in the Paris metro. The hysteria seems to have made its way to the UK. Bedbugs have been spotted on the Eurostar, on the London Underground, and even on their way to America. These have been accompanied by lots of instructional videos, some sensible, some not, on how to avoid infestations. And back in France, the government held special meetings to discuss the crisis. Gilad, I'm not going to lie, I was a little worried when all this hysteria first broke out. Was I right to be so worried? Well, the good news is that they're not dangerous. They can't spread diseases, and the worst they can really do is leave you with itchy bites. The bigger concern really is that they tend to be very psychologically unpleasant to think about or to see. But numbers are on the rise. Bedbug numbers were very low from the 50s through to the 90s. And then from about 2000, numbers have been going up. They went down a little during the pandemic, but we are seeing a sort of post-COVID bounce back. It's probable that the specific blow up in France has more to do with that country's fear of reputational damage. They're hosting the Rugby World Cup this year, the Olympics next year. And so it's very concerning to them that Paris might be seen as off limits. Okay, but are we safe in London? To be honest, I'd also like to know if they're safe in Paris because I'm supposed to be going on holiday. The sad news is there probably isn't a city where you're free of bedbugs. They're highly mobile. They can travel around on clothing and luggage. So if there's an infestation in one place, they're likely to travel elsewhere. And they thrive in warm urban environments where they're close to lots of people. 
And as I was saying, their numbers have been going up. Cities have been reporting more and more cases since around the year 2000. There are good numbers out of Zurich for some reason, and they showed that up till about 2005, there were about 20 complaints a year, and then within a decade, that had increased to over 100. And what's behind this increase? So we don't know for certain. We can't pinpoint it any one date or any one cause. But there are a couple of possible explanations. One is people are just traveling more and bed bugs are coming along for the ride. And unfortunately, climate change is also not our friend here because bed bugs breed in warm temperatures and temperatures around 25 degrees allow them to breed faster than they would if the temperatures were lower. And you said earlier that they're difficult to eradicate. Gilad, you're really not giving me much confidence here. How difficult are we talking? Well, this difficulty is another reason that they're on the rise, because most of the tools that we've used historically against them can't be used anymore, either because they're dangerous to humans, like DDT or sulfur dioxide, which were once sprayed in homes, or because the bedbugs themselves are just developing resistance to the insecticides that we use. The ones that are susceptible die off, the ones that are resistant survive, and they have more and more children. So then is there anything that we can actually do? The most effective solution these days is heating. You get an exterminator and they bring a heater and it roasts your room, essentially. It turns the temperature to about 45, 50 degrees and that kills the bugs, that kills the eggs and that makes your home bed bug free. There are other less intensive solutions. There are sprays that can, in theory, trap the bed bugs, sort of prevent them from moving or block up their respiratory pores. New insecticides are also being developed, but it's not really a priority because these insects don't spread disease, don't cost a lot of money, and so the market drive isn't there. But if the hysteria continues and people scream loudly enough and are willing to part with their money, then the incentives might shift. Crikey. Well, Gilad, thank you. I am now officially scared to go to bed tonight. (laughs) I'm sorry about that, Doris. Okay, public service message, that itch that you're feeling isn't a bed bug, it's your imagination. Let's move on to an issue squarely in the human realm. We try to navigate the choppy waters of economics on the show and to chase down the causes, however unlikely, of your kitchen table concerns. Inflation has been a big problem for countries around the world this year, and it remains high in many places. A few different things have been blamed for this. The after effects of the pandemic, for one, Of course, Vladimir Putin and his war in Ukraine. But recently, it seems as though a new enemy's emerged in the surprising form of pop music concerts. Joshua Spencer is a news editor based in our Singapore bureau. How's everyone back there? You feeling all right? You feeling good? One theme of 2023 was the return of huge global tours by pop stars like Harry Styles and Taylor Swift. They were able to return to the stage fully after the pandemic. One particularly good example of this was the singer Beyonce's Renaissance tour, which he took all over the world, including to Stockholm in Sweden. Around 46,000 fans travelled there for a chance to see her live. And that, in turn, led to a big rise in hotel prices for the short period around her concert. And then when Sweden's consumer price index figures, which are a measure of inflation were released later that month, they were curiously higher than expected. That actually led a local economist in Sweden to claim that Beyonce was somehow responsible for this, as though he could blame her for the rising prices. And what do you make of that assertion that Beyonce is single-handedly responsible for a rise in Swedish inflation? So in Beyonce's case, probably not. And actually, in most cases, probably not. Inflation is usually calculated by comparing a basket of goods and price rises of those goods rather than measuring sudden rises in one area, like hotels. Let's take Britain, for example. 750 different goods and services are included in its basket of goods. Concerts, theatres and cinema together make up about 0.8% of that basket. So for countrywide inflation to jump in somewhere like Sweden because of one single event is really unlikely unless it's on an enormous scale, something like the Olympic Games or a big event of that sort. Just to give you a sense of scale, fans of Taylor Swift were projected to spend around $600 million on tickets for her America tour. And over an equivalent period to that tour last year, consumers in America spent almost $7 trillion. So, Jason, there's no question that tours are a big business today and potentially bigger than ever. Taylor Swift's tour in particular is thought to be the most lucrative in history, but they're not that big. 
No, but there are kind of knock-on effects, right? That's true, Jason. Yeah, price rises in entertainment or these leisure industries can happen around concerts, as we saw in Stockholm for a short period of time. But that shouldn't spill over to affect other goods and services in different parts of the economy and make those things more expensive. And there can also be some other effects that reduce prices. So it's possible that the higher hotel prices may be offset by falling costs in other areas. To give you an example, to afford these really expensive tickets, which for Taylor Swift's tour went all the way up to $900 for the premium VIP packages in America, fans might skimp on other things in the weeks leading up to the concert such as going out for meals or drinks. And in theory, that would bring down demand for those goods and services, and in turn, prices in the lead up to the show. However, there is potentially a distinction here, which is in the case of small countries, and they might see a small bump in inflation as a result of a superstar tour. But in the round, central bankers shouldn't be concerning themselves too much with these giant concert tours. Maybe it's just that the Swifties among central bankers are a little cranky about those ticket prices. I think that's possible. But no, I think this is not something generally that central bankers should be bothering themselves with too much. When fans leave, the show ends, prices should fall back to normal levels pretty quickly. Nevertheless, though, there is a sort of changing economics of big tours, right? Like these tickets are just eye-wateringly expensive. That is true. It is a big moment for tours. The economics of tours are changing quite rapidly. But the price of seeing superstars like Taylor Swift has always actually been quite high in places like America. So there's an example from the 1850s of a soprano singer called Jenny Lind who toured America, and she sold tickets for around $6 each. And if you adjust that for inflation, that's around $230 today. The average Taylor Swift ticket is $254. So the difference in pricing isn't that stark if you adjust for inflation. But The economics of touring is changing in other ways. One important distinction to make is that artists like Taylor Swift are playing far bigger crowds. She's been taking the stage in football stadiums, tens of thousands of people. Jenny Lind might have been paying to a few hundred. And in fact, this new era of huge tours has also now become a competition to stage bigger and better live shows as artists are increasingly relying on touring to make money in the age of streaming. So I think on her tour every night, Taylor Swift changes into roughly 16 different outfits over a three-hour show. And so given all the costs involved in carting around an expensive live set all over the world, that's perhaps why Miss Swift is choosing to perform her only Southeast Asia dates in Singapore. Maybe to a more microeconomic question for you, Josh, were you one of the people who camped out there for the Singapore shows? I couldn't possibly reveal that, Jason. Um, (laughs) But no, I wasn't. I didn't fortunately get tickets. But I think that some people in the the Economist's office in Singapore did acquire tickets, but online instead of in person. So I'm sure they'll enjoy that next year when she comes. Josh, thanks very much for joining us and better luck next time. Thanks very much, Jason. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Swift, Leon, get it? But keeping our focus on famous people. Despite there being four indictments, two state, two federal, and a total of 91 felony counts against him, one thing that hadn't happened to Donald Trump was getting a mugshot. But then in August, when he surrendered to authorities in Fulton County, Georgia, he was charged with election meddling and snapped. We just received the former president's mugshot. It's the first time that a booking photo has been released of a former president. The mugshot released by Fulton County Sheriff's Office. Now, we should say that Mr. Trump denies all the charges and, you know, looking at this picture, he looks pretty peeved about them. All angled eyebrows and hard man stare. And with that snap, he joins what is actually a sometimes proud tradition. The origins of the mugshot date back to as early as the 1840s. Annie Crable is a news editor for The Economist. There were photographs taken of criminals, and this was documented in Belgium, for instance. But the modern mugshot, so a composite of a front-facing photo and a photo in profile, that was standardized in France in the 1880s. The mugshot was one piece of a bigger system of identification that was created by Alphonse Bertillon. He was a police officer and biometrics enthusiast. He created a system to catch serial offenders. Upon being arrested, a suspect was photographed and painstakingly measured with lots of instruments. This was very complicated. Bertillon wrote a manual of instructions and a way to measure 
the length of the head alone, for example, is outlined in 18 steps. But the point of this was to create a really detailed index. So if there was a repeat offender, police could use these measurements to find a mugshot on file. I'm sorry, 18 steps to measure the length of a head. Surely they've come up with some more efficient methods by now. Yeah, exactly. Bertillon's measurements and the system overall was basically replaced by fingerprinting. But the mugshot element of it survived, and they can still communicate lots to police. These are often taken at the discretion of law enforcement. So, for example, if the suspect is a flight risk. But from a popular perspective, rather than a law enforcement one, some mugshots are iconic examples of photography. They really get to the subject's core. It was fun to look through some famous examples. So David Bowie, for instance, he was booked on marijuana charges in 1976. And in his mugshot, he's looking super stylish, really self-possessed. Jane Fonda was also arrested in the 70s for drug possession. These actually turned out to be vitamins, and that's perhaps why she is looking so defiant in hers. She has this shaggy haircut, and she's holding up a fist in protest. Frank Sinatra is another fun example. He was booked for seduction, which was apparently a crime in 1938, It is, quote, sleeping with a single female of good repute. And you might recognize his mugshot from The Sopranos. A poster version was hanging in Tony Soprano's office in the Bada Bing, their headquarters. Okay, so these mugshots, they tell us about the person, you know, the subject core, as you said. But could they also perhaps tell us something about the time? Yeah, John Lewis is a good example. So he was a civil rights activist and later a congressman from Georgia. And he would routinely tweet his mugshot to mark the anniversary of his release after he was arrested in 1961 for using a toilet reserved for white people. So something that should not have been criminalized. Another civil rights era example, Rosa Parks. She has a famous mugshot that a lot of people associate with her trademark refusal to vacate her bus seat. It was actually taken later after a separate arrest for the bus boycott that followed in Montgomery, Alabama. Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin both had mugshots for revolutionary activities in Russia under the czar. And then there are some others that are less noble, perhaps, but maybe their larger historical lesson that they're communicating is the excesses of fame and celebrity. We have these bleak mugshots of Hugh Grant Tiger Woods. You can Google those. And then now there's Donald Trump. So Annie, what's the legacy of his mugshot likely to be? Yeah, so Trump would like to present his mugshot as part of his bigger grievance campaign against America's justice system, which he claims is rigged against him. He wants to present himself as righteous and persecuted, waging this noble fight. And It's true that his indictments, there have been four of them, have all galvanized supporters rather than alienated them. In the lead up to his arrest in Georgia, we knew he was going to get a mugshot. Law enforcement often has discretion. And in his earlier indictments in New York and in Washington, D.C., for example, Trump is a very famous person. He was not considered a flight risk and he was not subjected to a mugshot. But in Georgia, the law is that if you are booked on a felony charge, you have to take a mugshot. And the sheriff there was clear that all defendants would be treated equally. So we knew the mugshot was coming. And in the lead up to his arrest, his campaign team was selling merchandise that was branded with a photoshopped fake mugshot. But the fabricated image really had no power. The point of a mugshot is authenticity. There was a fan of Bertillon, the guy who created the modern mugshot, and this person was trying to introduce this system to police departments in America. And he wrote that the mugshot gives each human being an identity which is, quote, durable and always recognizable. And that, you can say for Trump, he has already achieved. Annie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Ore. That's all for this episode of The Intelligence. Let us know how you've been enjoying the show. Drop us a line at podcasts at economist.com. And we'll see you back here tomorrow. 